Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, we are back at a special place in the Pima Air and Space Museum, which is the 390th Bomb Group Memorial Museum. And we're here with Alex, who's going to be showing us around. And let's just get you to do that full introduction again, because you did it so well. Who are you, sir? My name is Alex Chambers. I'm the Business and Operations Manager here at the 390th Memorial Museum. Wonderful. So, Alex, you've considering your office is covered in pictures of this fantastic aircraft before she was restored to the state she's in now. If you're going to show us around, tell us about her past life and what you've found during the restoration. Yeah, this is a really interesting airframe in and of itself. So it's restored back to its World War II configuration, back to as it rolled off the Vega assembly line at mm -hmm. Burbank. Uh, it's in the markings of the 390th, so it carries the tail number of 4231892. That was a B-17 that flew 24 combat missions from England over Germany, France, and Belgium, and it was shot down after four months of combat missions. Mm. So this plane that it represents did not survive the war. It's named All Be Around, but as it was discovered, after it had been restored to this configuration, it was actually painted olive drab the whole time it was in England <laughs> flying the air war over Germany. So in its experimental configuration, it's not accurate to the tail number it carries right now, also, the nose art is not accurate to that plane. Mm -hmm. After the guys over at Davis Mothin had restored it back to this paint scheme, they saw an HBO special called Reunion at Farborough, and there was a shot of that airplane, that real airplane, <laughs> and it was olive drab, and it had this totally different nose art. So it's a bit of a fictional representation of a World War II plane right now. But I suppose it's going to be good for showing the length and the different types of aircraft at the 390th. Through, flew during its time in England. So, exactly. Yeah. So you'll be, you'll be able to pick up quite a bit. So we've been teasing everybody by having it behind the camera. And everyone, the fabulous Joe Welding is, is on camera juicy. So become a damn Castilian patron. And you never know, you can join me here at the museum. So where do you want to start? You know, I think the tail is a fantastic place to start because that's where we're representing the 390th. Great. So the square J on our tail represents the 390th bomb group. <laughs> The third air division was represented with squares, and the J designates it as the 390th bomb okay. group here. Oh, so that's why some have the triangles. Exactly. Yeah. The three different air divisions were represented by different shapes, and the J represents the 390th specifically. Okay. It's a partial serial number, a tail number on the plane. So the real serial number that this represents is 42-31892. Okay. The Air Force still uses that same moniker in its serial numbers. Mm -hmm. The first two digits would be the year that Congress approved purchasing the airframe. So this represents a plane that was approved and financed in 1942. So it's not a manufacturing year, it's when it went onto the books. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so th this is your game, mate. Off you go, show us around. We're, we're just here geeking out. So what is it about this section that's gonna, you're gonna show us first? Well, you know, I think we should, well, um, the real, let's talk first about the real serial number. The yeah. real serial number of this airplane is 4485828. Okay. That's the real airframe. Mm -hmm. It's one of the last 13 B-17s produced at the Vega Burbank plant. Mm -hmm. So that's the real serial number of this plane. And that's what would have been emblazoned on this tail when it was delivered to the Army Air Force in July of 1945. So too, too late for Europe, but I guess they were, had the Pacific in the back of their mind. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it was sent to the Dallas Love Modification Center, the Lockheed Mount uh, at Dallas Love Field, mm -hmm. uh, for some additional equipment to prepare it for a potential air war. Okay. Uh, but then it ended up going in storage at Lubbock, Texas. Okay. While it was in storage at Lubbock, Texas, the Navy set aside a large block of these final Vega built B 17s. Those Vega B 17s were then diced up between the Navy and the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard was assigned 20 different serial numbers. 16 ended up being delivered to the Coast Guard starting in 1946. Okay. The Navy finished the modifications. So it was built as a B-17G, then was assigned to the Navy, then the Coast Guard got a hold of it and it was redesignated a PB-1G. And it was <laughs> reconfigured to TB-17H US, Air For US Army Air Force configuration, which was an air sea rescue configuration. Okay. So all the gun emplacements, the ball turret, the side guns, the top turret, the chin turret, all of those were removed and a radar was installed in the nose. Okay. So at one time it had the provisions to have a Higgins mm -hmm. lifeboat strapped to the bottom, but we don't believe that RB-17 ever had that Higgins lifeboat okay. attached to it. 
It was the only Coast Guard PB-1G that never had that Higgins lifeboat. Then in 1947, this B-17 was sent for further modifications. Where our ball turret is, was gutted out and a large nine lens camera was installed right here. Oh, right, this okay. camera had been built by Fairchild in the 1930s. It was delivered to the Navy, well, potentially to the Navy in 1936. Mm -hmm. And it was used with the Navy's joint uh, research efforts with the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. The U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey was the first scientific uh, administration of the U.S. government. It was formed in 1807. And this large nine camera lens had been in a PBY Catalina during the war and then was slapped in RB-17. So what was the camera used for? It was used for mapping the continental United okay. States. So from 1947 through 1959, this 1B-17 mapped uh, Puerto Rico, the entire continental United States, including Alaska. All right. And it, it started really a lot of the, the mapping that would become very important later. Mm -hmm. So it was doing coastal mapping. That was really the original mission. But that camera was able to pick up terrain and elevation features okay. that were very important for aerial uh, maps, mm -hmm. as well as road building projects that would be going on as the U.S. was rebuilding after World War II. So slightly stereoscopic images that we were collecting from it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it was a ring of eight camera lenses with one center camera lens. Oh, right. And it would take... So almost like a, the 360 Insta cameras you, you, you get now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It would take a two foot by two foot square image. Mm -hmm. And it took 200 feet of camera roll to do one mapping mission. So there was uh, nine Coast Guard guys flying the plane and three US Coast and Geodetic Survey guys operating the equipment. One navigator and two camera operators. Okay which is incredible. And oh. they used the Norden bomb site from World War II to target where they were gonna map. Uh, so that might explain why some of the maps were a bit iffy. Maybe, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah. well, that's really interesting, because I know at the end of the Second World War, a lot of bomber command flew what they called the Cook's Tours, mm -hmm. which was just photographing Europe. So they'd fly missions out, essentially doing the same thing with big cameras to get more accurate maps for whatever might happen next. Mm -hmm. So exactly. it's, it's similar that, they were doing Europe, but then there was this opportunity to use these aircraft to fill in a lot of the gaps in the U.S. Because there, you know, you had the maps, but there wasn't the detail for what was hoping. Because I, I remember that from from school, because they did it in Canada as well. Yeah, very important yeah. to this mid-century. A lot of construction projects, expansion of cities, the interstate highways, canal projects, dam building. Mm -hmm. This mapping was very important for a lot of the public works that went on. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Right. What's next? So one of the pieces of evidence of its Coast Guard days is our door here. So in World War II, a B-17 would have had pins on the doors that would have just been pulled and the door would have been released if a crew needed to jump out. Mm -hmm. Our B-17 door is hinged. Okay. So it's coming. Oh, of course, it's going in. Yeah, the, the, that's obvious now that I see it. Yeah. yeah. So one piece of evidence that's left over probably from 1946, 1947. Ah. And then we can pull back the ladder here. If we want to take a look inside, I want to show you the, the flooring around okay. the ball turret. Do you need a hand or are you good? Now we should be good here. There we go. All right, so I'm not the most graceful in getting in this plane, unfortunately. Put the camera at me while I was doing that. <laughs> So you can come on in here. Okay. Now, don't point the camera at me for this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we did this yesterday, climbing into a Boeing aircraft, <laughs> very gracefully. There you go. So what, what's that on our list so far? B-52A and B-17G in two days. Yeah. We're, do we're doing well. <laughs> So as, right. you, as you see it now, Oops. it's been reconfigured to its World War II configuration mm -hmm. with our waist guns and a ball turret. And our frame that holds up our ball turret is actually out of a B-24 that okay. was cut and welded to be B-17 size. Our ball turret was found, as I've heard, under a little old lady's porch. <laughs> so very unique. But you can see how there's wood planking around the ball turret. Yep. That's not accurate to the World War II configuration. And I have some photos of it as a Coast Guard plane with the camera. And the reason it has that wood planking all around the ball turret 
was so that the camera operators could sit there and maintain the camera and operate it. Okay, so it's you you've got a little bit of both both of the lives that you're trying to tell still in the aircraft with that. And I guess oh that I always do that when I get in these things sort of smashing your head around. I was in a bow fighter once. It wasn't nice. <laughs> um, so it's you'd have I guess we have to remember it's not the camera on your phone that you just point and click. It's gonna be constant maintenance. It's gonna be vibrating a lot as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it may malfunction, film jams, all those good all those good things we remember from yeah. Our youths. <laughs> yeah, it was a 750 foot, foot uh, 750 pound camera in here, and then you had somewhere in where we're standing, 200 feet of camera or a film rolled. So these guys were constantly having to maintain this thing. They flew about 5,000 hours on the plane. Oh right. So when it was delivered to the Coast Guard, it had just 55 hours of flight time on the aircraft. When the Coast Guard finally parked it in October of 1959, it had 5,515 flight hours on the airplane. So she had a, a, a life that most B-17s would never have seen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it's part of the reason it was maintained in such a high condition, because mm -hmm. it was needed. It had yes. a job to do. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. And it's, that was, again, struck by size. Yeah, I'm just about, I'm able to stand up because the, the tail is <laughs> so the top is sticking out. But it's, you know, we, we, we're, we're three gentlemen of stature. Um, being in this thing with electric suit, fine gear, and I guess the, the guys with taking the, the, the footage would still be in all the same gear as well, because on a cold day, it's going to be bloody freezing in here. Exactly. Yeah. They were up at 30,000 feet for a mapping mission. Typical oh. combat missions were 26 to somewhere around 30,000 feet. So they literally used their World War II gear. They had... The electric bunny suits, they were wearing heavy leathers, oxygen masks, all the equipment that was necessary for the combat missions was retained by the Coast Guard. You see, that is the obvious question I should have asked because I did not think they'd be that high. Yeah, mm. yeah. So you, you're getting, a fin on that two foot picture, you're getting a phenomenal amount of detail on that from that sort of height. Exactly. So, oh, oh, well, you are in that sort of photographic reconnaissance sort of range, aren't you, from high altitude, so long, long focal length lenses -ish. Yeah, I think that two foot by two foot piece of film was about 120 square miles okay. on each, yeah. each shot. So I guess that's what, a picture every 120 miles at what, cruise speed of 200? Yeah, that's math. Yeah, that's math. I'll do it. <laughs> I we'll figure do it out. We'll put, we'll put a little text bit up on the bottom yeah. of the video saying, we did the math later. Yeah. Um, wow, okay. Is that... That's good. And so we can tell she's a G as well because of the offset um, waist gun position. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we're missing a few things. There would have been armor plating here mm -hmm. in front of each gunner. That's something that we haven't replicated yet. And I doubt they would have had that in the Coast Guard days trying yeah. to save yeah. weight. Certainly a lot of this was also stripped out from its firefighting days. Yeah. So it flies with the Coast Guard until October 14th, 1959. Mm -hmm. Its last mission is in Alaska. It lands at Boeing Field in Seattle in a ceremony to commemorate it being the last flying B-17. It's parked in Elizabeth City, New Jersey in October 1959. It's put up for sale shortly afterwards, 1960. It's purchased by a civil operator and becomes N9323R. And it's gutted of pretty much everything. <laughs> we don't really know what happened to it for those first two years that it was in private ownership, but then it was quickly acquired by Dothan Aviation in Dothan, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where the hoppers would have been, probably in the Bombay, but it was first set up as an agricultural sprayer. Oh, right. Okay. So in our Bombay would have been a big hopper, and it had spray bars on the back of the wings. And it was used <laughs> for fighting fire ants. Fire ants? Mm-hmm. Flipping egg. This is a mad career for this aircraft. Absolutely. Yeah. Just to say, was she the last B-17 flying for the U.S. government? any branch of the U.S. government yep. flown by a manned crew. Okay. There were a number of drones used in atomic bomb tests shortly after this plane, okay. but they were not manned. They'd already been set up as drones. Okay. So they just flew into nuclear wasteland. We've done an episode about that as well. <laughs> um, so, so she is really a special aircraft. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Didn't, didn't get to fight the Germans, but got to fight fire ants and fires. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Right. Continue, sir. Which way do you want us to go? You know, let's let's head up out and up to the nose of the plane, okay. real quick. 
I'll jump out first. Hopefully more gracefully than I got in. We can fil film Joe getting out, which will be quite funny. <laughs> oh, he did it so well. There we go. <laughs> it's when you see them sort of getting into the, the nose when they just sort of reach up and lift their sort of legs in as, as well, and you think, how the hell? If I tried doing that, I'd put my back out. <laughs> right. Thank you, sir. That's right. Perfect. Cool. Right, that so, way. Yeah, I haven't found any evidence of the spray bars okay. still on it. And I have seen pictures, not of our airplane, but of other B-17s that use the hard points here. So here's where our hard points start. You've got four bolt holes here. Okay. And up here, you have four more bolt holes. You get a great shot of it from like right here. So these four here and then these four here. Mm -hmm. And that's where a hard point would have been attached for carrying thousand pound bombs during the war. That was rarely used on the B-17Gs, but it was a provision they had to carry extra load. B-17G could carry up to 8,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds internally and 2,000 pounds under the wing. This was retained we don't know why by the Coast Guard. And as the ag sprayer with Dothan, I don't know if they would have had tanks here mm -hmm. or if those would have been in the bomb bay. But there are some B-17s that you see that were converted to sprayers that used these hard points for large tanks. Looks like P-51 or P-38 drop tanks okay. converted for spraying. And the really unique thing is right here. Let's see if we can get it open. That is the bomb release mechanism. <laughs> Sentimental Journey and Sally B both do not have that wiring. Most of the B-17s after the war had all that wiring gutted out of it. And then that just patched up and, and sealed, yeah. Yeah, how ours retained that and survived all those years of different operators is a mystery. Wow. And a really rare piece of B-17 history. That's amazing. I, when I saw the little model with the, the thousand pounders underneath it that you have over there, I was like, oh, that's a little bit of this aircraft, the B-17 as a whole, that always has slipped in my mind. Because mm -hmm. we sort of get into, especially being in England, it's, oh, isn't it nice? It's got a small bomb. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a Lancaster. You know, a mosquito could carry this amount. Yeah. But when you see the, the extra provisions going in and seeing something like that, that is, you know, they, they weren't standing still, were they? No, yeah. no. And this was really a late war provision on the B-17s. Mm -hmm. You talk to Colonel Bashong, he never flew with the hard points. He mm -hmm. flew F and G models, and none of his planes had this provision for it. This was really just the end production runs of G models that had it. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have cared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, onwards, where next? Yeah, so just jumping back really quickly to its Coast Guard days, the chin turret was the first thing that they removed. So it was built with the chin turret. All mm -hmm. G models yeah. had that extra defensive mechanism. They replaced this with a radar here okay. for all the Coast Guard PB1Gs. It retained that for its photo mapping missions. It was, a, I believe, a ground scanning radar mm -hmm. and weather radar okay. that they had there. So this is an entire reproduction. It's not an original chin turret. So our chin turret's not original. Our tail's not original. Our ball turret is a real ball turret, thankfully. Yeah. But it, it's done well enough that you wouldn't really notice. And I, I always love the zippers on the, the turret. Mm -hmm. You just think, when that order went out, yeah, that high-speed aerodynamic device. Yes. <laughs> Pick up just a couple of knots as well. Yes. <laughs> so it's, I think it's one of the things about aviation that's always fascinating is the adaptability of aircraft you wouldn't think would be that adaptable. So, you know, there's, there's someone sitting around saying, well, we can get a radar in there and we put a camera in the back and just, just keep, them, keep them going for a long while because they've got the range. They're durable, you know, reliable as, as all get up by this point. Um, and you can, you can crack, crack on from, from there to make, it, make its mission life do something 
entirely different to what it was originally purposed for. I, I, I love that. Yeah, and they had all the parts. There were tons of 1820 engines sitting mm -hmm. around in Kingman. There were tons of these airframes sitting around in Lubbock and Kingman mm -hmm. and AS Litchfield. So it was cheap. It mm -hmm. was easy to service. There were lots of men that were trained on it. There were lots of men that knew how to repair it. And it had very functioning pieces of equipment like the Norden bombsight. Yep. And then they just updated more modern radios, more modern radar, really the advancements of the late 40s and 50s that had come out of the war. Mm -hmm. And you've got the bear in the nose. That's Colonel Bashong's bear. He oh. brought that in personally. Did he? he? insisted we put it up there to commemorate Roscoe Ann. <laughs> Tune in for our interview from last year with, with Dick, which was just fantastic. I'm disgusted we didn't get over to see him yesterday, but I'll just have to sneak back soon. He's here every Thursday. Yeah, he is wonderful. Hello, Roscoe. All right, onwards, sir. Keep so us going. Let's look up our front hatch here. I beg your pardon. So as you climb up this, you'll be able to see a serial number tag on okay. here. That's where the original serial number would have been. And R still retains its US, uh, or its US Coast Guard Bureau number, 77254. So she's still got a bit of her identity. Exactly. That Army <laughs> Air Force number is gone, the manufacturer serial number is gone, but its Coast Guard number was retained. <laughs> but yeah, it, we were just saying before, that, that 5,000 hour figure is just remarkable for an airframe like this. And I guess not having to go through what many of its sisters had to, but it's, it's in really good condition for an aircraft that was flown you know, 5,000 hours with, with the mapping service and then all the years as a fire bomber. And, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it flew in Alaska, it flew in Puerto Rico on these mapping missions. The Coast Guard obviously maintained it, mm. but you can see some evidence of its life. Like, see some of the dings in our skin here? That's probably ice coming off of the propeller here. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is it would have had to have had its de-icing system uh, with the Coast Guard. But when we inspected this plane, it's all been removed, probably from its firefighting days. Mm. Because as a firefighter, it was down fighting in the summer months mostly, yeah. up in Montana, up in Wyoming, uh, in California. It didn't need its de-icing. Okay. So there's a de-icing system that sprays glycol on the propellers, and that has all been removed from this aircraft okay. when we got it. During the war, they also had de-icing boots on the wings, but those were commonly, well, and the wings and the tails, those were commonly removed because they were found to be ineffective during yeah. the war. Yes, they'd push the button and usually nothing would happen because the boots had frozen. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so then this thing is retired from the Coast Guard. Uh, in 1960, it sells for about $6,000 at an auction at Elizabeth City, New Jersey. The guy that purchased it, he turns around and he sells it two months later for $13,500. <laughs> It, it sits around for a year or two. It ends up in Dothan. It has the, the hopper and the, the spray, sputter bars added to it, mm -hmm. fights fire ants. Uh, it's only at Dothan for, I think, three or four months, something like that. He has four B-17s total, and he ends up selling this B-17 to Black Hills Aviation, and they convert it to a firefighting plane. So they strip out the bomb bay, and they build a tank where the bomb bay is. Okay. And it's a slurry bomber, and it fights fires, essentially until 1975 with Black Hills. So it fights with Black Hills as B-30 is okay. its firefighting tail number. Uh, it later has tanker number 37 applied to it. Um, and I believe it fought fires into the maybe 76, 77 fire season. Oh, right. And it's parked in 1978 up just north of here in Mesa, Arizona at Falcon Field, where the Commemorative Air Force now has Sentimental Journey. Yeah. There's a bunch of firefighters that are parked up there. Air Specialties then negotiates with the, what is the Air Force Museum in Dayton at that time, now known as the National Museum of the Air Force. And he trades this B-17 back to the Air Force, back to its original owner for a C-54 out of the boneyard. So a military version of a DC-4. <laughs> the story is, and I don't know how accurate this is, he puts his four highest hour engines on the plane. He flies <laughs> it down from Mesa into Davis Moth and here right across the street. He picks up his C-54 and he takes off. So. We know it's traded back in about 78 on paper. Mm -hmm. In 1980, there's a big ceremony. So in November of 1980, it flies in and it's escorted by a P-51. So at the time, it's in this bare metal, it's got orange cowling, it's got an orange tail with its firefighting markings, and it's escorted by a P-51 in a civilian paint scheme as well. I haven't found the end number of that P-51. I'm dying to figure out which one it was. <laughs> but yes, dear, dear viewers, if you know, get in touch with Alex. Absolutely. So Colonel Joseph Muller, the last commander of this bomb group in World War II. He's a reserve commander at the Strategic Missile Wing over at Davis-Mothen. 
they've reactivated the 390th in the 60s, mm -hmm. and they've built a small museum over there of the World War II history to give the missileers some history, some yeah. esprit de corps, and he's really a driving force in building that museum and helping negotiate for this B-17. So he, Brigadier General Robert Waltz, who had served in the 390th, and Captain Hayes, who's the curator over at, the, at Davis Moffin for the Strategic Missile Wing, have a ceremony when this B-17 lands. It sits over at Davis Moffin, some missileers and some EC-130 guys help strip the paint off of it. They apply this paint scheme, they apply this nose art on it, then they're watching an HBO special <laughs> and they see, oh, this plane should have been olive drab. It should have had this white kind of haphazardly done nose art to it but it's a good representation of a 390th B-17. Fantastic. So it sits over at Davis Moffin for a couple of years, and Colonel Muller helps negotiate for this building that we're in right now to be built at Pima Air Museum. It's a separate entity, it's a separate 501c3. It's dragged over here, it's still missing its chin turret, it's still missing the ball turret, it's still missing most of the tail, and from the mid 80s onwards, volunteers help restore it back to exactly its World War II configuration. And I, I keep saying this, don't, when, when I brought my wife in on, on Monday, she just went, wow. And it's, I, you know, interviewing Bill last year, it was, I just wanted to make clear how well this museum is done. And that's even before you get up to the photos, which are just terribly moving in the right way. Um, and I guess we've got to go upstairs and try to find, find this, the aircraft that this represents in green with her crew. Oh yeah, and it's stunning. You think about it. This bomb group was assigned about 300 B-17s during the war. Mm. Of the original 35 that left the United States and arrived in England, only one of those original 35 sur survived the war. Wow. Of those 300, none survived the scrapper. Mm. There's not a single B-17 that exists today that served with the 390th. Two have been restored back to 390th square J tail markings. Mm. RB-17 on static display, and Liberty Bell, who restoration began in 1992. She flew from 2004 to 2011, unfortunately had a catastrophic engine fire, was put down in a field. The field was so muddy, the firefighters couldn't get to it, and that plane was consumed by fire, oh. and it's under restoration again. But none of the 300 survived. Two were restored back to this bomb group's history. So with you as the operations director around here, what's it like coming in in the morning Granted, you, you come in through the back door, mm -hmm. but how often do you sneak in just to, to have a look? Oh, and I'm, I'm looking I, for the evidence. The, of the boss is standing behind us, yes. so don't, 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 <laughs> don't worry about him. Yeah, so my passion project is searching for those pieces of history yep. of this airframe, but every day is a, a lesson in perspective. You know, we, we look at this plane, it's this beautiful plane, and it does represent those 300 aircraft mm -hmm. and those hundreds of men yep. that serve this, this group, and that's just one bomb group out of 40 that was stationed in England waging the air war over Europe. And then you look upstairs and you see 310 crew photos. And you see the faces of the young men looking back at you, 19, 21 year old guys. And that's what this museum is really about. It's not as much about the equipment as it is about the men who flew this, maintained this, armed this. And it, it's an incredible piece of history. And our, our days are not dealing with life and death. No. These men were really facing life and death every moment of the day. Two thirds of the air crew did not come home. About one third became prisoners of war. About one third were killed in action. Yeah. And for all the the fun and games around movies and TV shows and things, that's the that's the thing that needs to be remembered. And these things were not expected to last, so it's wonderful to be able to get up close and be shown around one with a very very unique history. Absolutely. And now telling a fantastic history as well, and Dick's chair as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's incredible that we have two 100-year-olds World War II veterans that sit here under the wing and they hold court yeah. all day long. And it's encouraging to see the young men and women that come in here and they stand there and they listen and then they get to see and touch pieces of history and it really puts in perspective. The kids today, they're going to be the last generation that gets to meet these World War II histories and hear yeah. the first-person perspectives. So it's so important that we preserve these exhibits, preserve these pieces of material history, so future generations can understand what this war was about. 100%. Alex, thank you so much for your time and for thank showing you. us around. I appreciate it. Cheers. We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum to visit with Director of Collections Andrew Bailey and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Welcome to the Pima Air and Space Museum. Today we're going to talk about one of our most recent restorations, the General Dynamics F-16B Fighting Falcon. 
The Fighting Falcon was a response to the Air Force looking for a lightweight fighter that was a cheaper alternative to the expensive F-15. It ended up developing from an air superiority fighter into a multi-role aircraft. It was named the Fighting Falcon, but was commonly known as the Viper by its pilots, which came from the popular TV show Battlestar Galactica, which featured the Viper fighter. The B model is a fully combat-capable trainer version of the F-16A. Its only difference between the A model is that it had a shorter range due to less fuel cells because of the second seat. Other than that, it had the same performance and weapons capabilities. Our aircraft was the first F-16B to come off the assembly line. It served in training units at Hill Air Force Base, Luke Air Force Base, and McDill. It then ended up with the Florida Air National Guard and then spent the last three years serving with the South Carolina Air National Guard before going into storage at Davis Mountain Air Force Base at their AMARC facility. We ended up acquiring the aircraft in 2017 and after a few years of working on it and repainting it, it went out on display just the last couple weeks. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now, back to the show. We'll be handing this around a bit. It's a little wood step up. Okay. It always gets to me when you're like, how the hell did anyone get out of these things? It's amazing, isn't it? You think of all the layers of clothing and the gear. Yes. The parachute harness, the parachute, uh, the Mae West. Flat jacket. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, granted they were Depression era kids and uh, shorter and thinner than many of us. But nevertheless, so many of them did get out of these planes in oh. distress. It's just phenomenal. See, you, you did promise not to do it, I think. <laughs> so, oh, flare gun in there as well for... Right, for visual signaling. So it's so one way the Germans couldn't listen in on uh, communications between tower and aircraft or among the aircraft in the formation. You can eavesdrop on any kind of radio signal, but not a not a colored flare. That absolutely fantastic logo on there, which again not as roomy as you would think. No, yeah, the the crew including the flight crew, were, were almost afterthoughts. Uh, bare minimum space, bare minimum survival systems, uh, very little uh, in the way of comfort or even bare, bare bones uh, safety, mm -hmm. for that matter. So as Alex was saying, they were flying the photographic missions at high altitudes, so that all that, the oxygen heating systems are all still in the aircraft. Which is there, there we go, heated suit. Which I guess would always turned up to high. <laughs> I would I can't imagine yeah. that it wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah, as as somebody who spends far too much time with British aircraft, it's always strange not to see the, the standard six mm -hmm. right in the middle of the, the dash is the slightly different approach that sure. you, you chaps took over here with instrumentation. And of course, the, the co-pilot, you know, his job besides spotting relief for the pilot was to really monitor the engine performance mm -hmm. gauges. He had the best view of those. Um, pilot had the aircraft orientation, uh, they, basically the aviator uh, indicators. You promised, Jeff. <laughs> and of course, his autopilot or handing it over to the bomb site, even. Yes. Yep. Activating the uh, autopilot yeah. so that the, the Norden could fly the plane. And you can see even down that right corner by sort of where his knee would be, the hand pump for priming the engine for startup to get the first engine going. <laughs> it, yeah, as, 
Yeah. Ru rudimentary and high tech of its age. All it, in the it same really size. Is, yeah. yeah, it's. We, we can look at all the analog gauges and the, the exposed wiring and the uh, bicycle cable, basically, that runs between the, um, uh, the controls and the uh, uh, control surfaces and think, oh, how, how antiquated. Yet, you know, this was pretty close to the equivalent of space shuttle technology for the 1930s mm -hmm. um, as the shuttle was to the 1970s. This was high tech leading edge and way and above anything that these young boys would have encountered in civilian life before being th uh, thrust into combat in this machine and having the expectation that you knew its operation down cold, so cold that in the adrenaline rush of combat during a sudden emergency, a fire, a hit, uh, equipment failure, engine failure, you knew you had muscle memory yeah. as to where your, your hands needed to be going um, for any particular eventuality. Um, th this was extreme high tech for the mid-1930s. And yes, uh, you know, the B-29 came along and had completely different systems. Um, pressurization. Pressurization. Ventilation. Incredibly more powerful engines and uh, navigation, fire control, bomb sight, you name it. Uh, very different than the B-17. But nevertheless, this was much akin to like Apollo or space shuttle technology uh, to these kids. Right. Shall we... Try not to stand on the sign as we go down. Again, you know, this never comes across, dear viewer, on the telly. You know, we're all gentlemen of about six foot. This is not designed for us. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> and, and this space would have been far more crowded than it is right now because we don't have the top turret here. We just have a replica. All the machinery that the guy stood in which is on display over there, is not here. Yeah, so you're squeezing so, around that to go back. Yeah, you had to orient the frame in a certain way in order to go from there to here and back. Uh, and again, with all your flight gear on. That's a good good shout, Bill, that we had a lot of space in there that normally wouldn't That's be That's right. It would have been far more claustrophobic for the three of us if it had been fully set up as it would have in combat. So we've got controls for the, the turret in there, Norden bombsight out the front, navigators 50. Small and large walk around bottles. Yeah. H2X set. Mm -hmm. Little view yeah. screen. Radio direction finding. It is absolutely stunning. And interesting that so much stuff was able to stay on board because of the mapping. That I guess you didn't have to go overly mad hunting for well, well, the guys that were restoring it going too mad to get all the bits. It was pretty stripped out. Um, for the, both mapping and uh, firefighting purposes. So a lot of uh, reacquisition of the equipment took place by 390th veterans when we first got the uh, aircraft on loan from the Air Force. Oh, I remember you saying that you sort of put the, 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 the 390th, put it the word for anything anybody had, wasn't it? And yes. And sort of getting all kinds of bits and pieces. The ball turret yep. uh, was found under uh, a lady's porch. Yes. <laughs> Drift meter. Yeah. I think one of the biggest um, differences between visitors today um, and maybe older visitors is understanding the difference in navigation. These guys had uh, to rely very heavily on dead reckoning. They had a few types of compasses and uh, uh, they 
basically best guess as to the true speed above ground, both laterally and forward speed um, of the aircraft. That's how you you guessed your location. There was no look at a screen and this shows you where you are. You used a pencil, a paper map, and you marked where you thought the plane was and you hoped for enough holes in the clouds that maybe you would see a landmark printed on your map. And uh, if uh, you had no holes in the cloud, then it really became uh, really a wag uh, as to I think I'm here. I think we're heading this way. <laughs> I think we'll get home yeah. or to the target or both. Uh, but there was there were no machinery, no electronic devices telling you where you actually were. You had things like this telling you what was below you, but you still had to figure out what the hell this teeny tiny little green screen would have would have shown you beneath. And you could uh, you could turn an antenna located below the nose of the plane here to to detect a radio beacon broadcast from England, and it would show as a little spike like on an oscilloscope, and that could tell you general direction, and you could somewhat interpret on this the uh, signal strength as to how far you might be from that antenna, if. On that particular day, the Germans weren't actually jamming the frequency that your radio and compass or depended on. Yeah, or spoofing it to try to get you off in yep. the wrong direction because you had many, many stories of very yeah. familiar sounding ladies and gentlemen telling you, come this way. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you for this, Bill. This has been fascinating. And my goodness, has the team done such a, a wonderful job creating a time capsule, really. It really is. It's a, a good description. It's a time capsule for 1945 uh, and when the world was at war. Um, and life was very cheap. Oh, yes. To find out more about the 390th Memorial Museum at the Pima Air and Space Museum, do check out their website at 390th.org and find out about the upcoming 390th Bomb Group Gathering at Grissom Air Museum in July. Details are to come, so be sure to follow the 390th on all their social media pages. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.